why we are so honored and uh, delighted to have Steve Munisteri join us tonight. Steve is the chair of the Republican Party of Texas and has been paying attention to this issue of Battleground Texas as well as others. We're going to have kind of a free flow here. He's going to he's going to talk, but a lot of this has to do with your questions. And let's just have a dialogue here. The vast majority of us. <laughs> Um, we'll find the candidates who are most like us on the Republican side of the ballot. So we have, we have a lot of unity in making sure that we, we keep the blue wave from coming and, and we, we really re restore our values in candidates and in the hearts and minds of voters. They, they've got to vote or we're done, so we need to reach out to our neighbors on that. So uh, we're looking forward to an interesting discussion tonight. Please help me welcome Steve Minister. Well, good evening. Is that the best you can do? Are you guys depressed? Good evening. Good evening. The other side's fired up. Are you fired up? Yes. Did I hear no? <laughs> well, for all you Obama supporters, I have to tell you I'm going to disappoint you. I don't use a teleprompter. Uh, and for those that haven't seen me speak, I don't even prepare a speech. I just talk about whatever I think you want to talk about. And if you want to interrupt my speech by answering, asking a question. I prefer that because uh, I don't think you guys need no. to be convinced that Obama's the worst president in the history of the United States, do I? No. I mean, most of our meetings, uh, when I go, you'll have speaker after speaker outlining the case against the Democrats, talking about how the country's going uh, far left, but everybody in this room knows that, right? So, I mean, I, I think we should really focus in on how we're going to win. Thank you. And part of focusing in on how we're going to win is knowing why we lost. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about why I think we lost, where the state is in the past, where it's now, where it's going, and maybe some of these things will surprise some of you. For example... It is no secret that the Democrats did everything that was outlined there. There's actually a book called Victory Lab. If you haven't re re read it, you need to read it. it. Talks about the data mining. I also got to see uh, the Obama campaign manager, Jim Messina, spend an hour on C-SPAN just detailing all the ways that they won. So I told Rance Priebus, the national chairman, I said, Rance, you could have saved that $10 million on that autopsy. All you had to do is watch C-SPAN for an hour, and they just would tell us. By the way, isn't autopsy the worst word in the world? Yes. I thought you only had an autopsy if you're, you were dead. Or we're not dead. But, but despite all those things, and I'll talk about those things in a moment, but there's a lot of misconceptions about this last election. For example, that the Democratic machine was so wonderful it increased their turnout. It didn't. 982,000 less votes. So I don't want to diminish all those things that were mentioned about the data mining and the 600 analytics. Those are all good tools. But despite all that, they turned out less votes. Here's another mis misconception. Our folks sat home. Have you all heard that one? It's not true. Romney got two and a half million more votes than McCain. Did you know that? Two and a half million more. So our side was up two and a half million, their side was down. Those are the final statistics from the final canvas. A lot of the, the original misconceptions came because there were a lot of articles written, because I read some of them, because I haven't revised my speeches, that talked about voter turnout being down, they used lower numbers, but when they did the final 50 state canvas, it was different than what was reported earlier, and then you never heard any corrections, did you? <coughs> Because you've heard about the mandate Obama got, right? So I just don't understand how you can have a mandate when you're in your second term, you're the incumbent, you have all the advantages, and you win by a smaller margin than you did the time before. In fact, the final numbers were 51.06 Obama, 47.2 uh, uh, Romney. So when you throw in independents and third party candidates, roughly 49% of the voting population voted against the incumbent. Now he won, and it wasn't a nail biter, but 51-49 to me is no mandate, is it to you? No. 
If that was a mandate, then I don't know why they didn't say that Ronald Reagan won in a landslide the first time he ran, because it was by a wider margin than that. And I was around back then. I'll tell you, they didn't say it was a landslide the first time. They did the second time. Now, that, that, that is a mandate, when you win every state by one, but it's a mandate. And in fact, that's not even a good tail whipping for us. A good tail whipping for us was in 1964 when we didn't even get 40%. Now I see Wally Wilkerson. I wanted to uh, go on, I'm not mean to pick on you Wally because you were out back then, but it seems like he got 38% if I remember. You got a good memory. That's it, good, 38%. So in 1964, that's a tail whip at 38%. Losing by 3.8% is not a tail whipping, and I'll talk to you in a moment about why some of that is. So that's one of the big misconceptions. Let me give you another misconception. Texas is a solid Republican state. How many of y'all heard that? Yeah. Let, me, let me just take a poll here. In 2008, now you probably know from the question what the answer is, but answer this as if you didn't know the answer before you came in from my question. If somebody asked you in the parking lot, after the 2008 elections, were there more Democrats elected in the state or Republicans? Honestly, what would you have said? Republicans? It's not true. 2008, the Democrats elected 2,800 office holders approximately, and we elected 2,400. So, if you look at a broad measure of the state, this is not a solid Republican state, nor has it been a solid Republican state for a very long time. If you take a chart, and I've got them at the offices, from 2000 to 2008, there's a straight downward trend for the Republican Party. In fact, if you look at 2006 and 2008, it's good to look at two elections so you don't have a, just a one-time thing. What I would call the base vote, which is the bottom of what your ticket does, what, the, what your worst candidate does is basically your base vote. Y'all follow me on that? We're barely above 50% in 2006 at the bottom of our statewide ticket. Now you can say, well, that's, that was just an aberration, because that's what folks said about Dallas County. We lost Dallas County in 2006. I remember talking to the state party chairman at dinner after that, said it was just everything was aligned the right way, we'd get it back in 2008. We didn't get it back in 2008, we didn't get it back in 2010, we didn't get it back in 2012, and that is a large county. If you look at 2008, we were barely above 50% on the bottom of the ticket in 2008. Does anybody remember what the breakdown in the state house was in 2008? You got a Rosemary wins the prize, Jeopardy for 500. Would you like to double down, go Jeff Idle Jeopardy? Did y'all hear that? 76 Republicans, 74 Democrats. How is that a solid Republican state? 76, 74. And do you know what the Democrats were saying after that? And I know this because I debated one. His name is Marvin Frost. He's a former congressman. And before Battleground Texas, there was another group, which still exists. It's called the Lone Star Project. It got reportedly about $15 million from the Barron and Bud law firm. Fred Barron, you know who Fred Barron is? Fred Barron's most notorious for being the financer for John Edwards that helped pay the hush money for Rael Hunter. Does that ring a bell now? Right. So they already financed this group that's already been working here. One of the things that Battleground Texas doesn't understand is they did us such a favor in saying everything they were going to do and putting it in print so I could take that to the RNC so that they did something that I couldn't do in three years, which is convince the RNC to spend money in Texas. So thank you, Democrats. But the truth of the matter is they already were doing this. There are groups called TOPS that were doing voter registration. It's kind of the acorn uh, reincarnation in, in districts like Ken Lagler's down there in Harris County. Uh, they were very active. The Lone Star Project had several other subsidiary groups. They were already doing this. And one of their leaders was Matt Angle, still is their leader. And he worked for Marvin Frost, and Marvin was associated. So he debated me uh, in 2010. This isn't that long ago, folks. And his debate with me and his prediction on WFAA, they predicted they were going to take the State House in 2010 because they've been making steady progress. So we made a bet. I bet him that we would have a net gain of five Republicans or more. He bet me that the Democrats would take the House 
He still hasn't paid off on that bet. Matter of fact, he never will as a Democrat. Say, now, if I had lost, he would be there, and then he'd try to charge it on my credit card and want us to pay it 20 years later. Um, Y'all got that one, didn't you? So, uh, they were already predicting that. So this state has never been as solid as people think uh, recently. And, and, and give you, let me give you some other data points. Now, you know we lost Dallas County, hadn't had it for six years, three, uh, 2006, eight, ten, four election cycles. We lost Harris County in 2008. It basically was a dead uh, heat in 2012. So that was an improvement over 2008 substantially. But that's about that's actually Harris County is actually lean Democratic. If you if, and I'm, I say that publicly, it's it's a lean Democrat county. Bear County is Democratic. Travis County is Democratic. And folks, the future of a a party is not in the rural areas, not in a growing state. So these are already worrisome things that have been there for five, six years. If you looked at the maps, uh, did any of y'all know Real Clear Politics? Have you checked? It's a great website. But they had uh, what they thought were solid states, lean states. If you looked before the last presidential election, Texas wasn't in the solid Republican state. It wasn't. They had it as lean Republican. Carl Rove and his analysis was saying lean Republican. I was saying lean Republican. It was a, it's a lean Republican state. Let me give you another data point. Let me, let me see if, uh, if Rosemary can get this one. Let me see if I can stump you on final jeopardy. How many states in the union are majority minority? Anybody? Take a guess. Four. Four. What is the only state in the union that's majority minority that has Republican elected officials statewide? Texas. Texas. Texas is 56% majority minority right now. You didn't know that. All right. Uh, which is why I'm going to tell you in a minute, I'm going to tie this to the number one problem our party faces, and you can just see it in this room. I'm a very frank talker. We don't look like the rest of the state. I'm just being honest with you. And until we do, we're going to be in danger of losing this state, and we'll never win another national election. I'm just being honest. Let me give you some statistics. Houston, Texas. Any of y'all live in the city of Houston? All right. Percentage of Anglo voters over the age of 65 is... 75%. So 75% of those over 65 in Houston are Anglo. Percentage of traditional minorities under 30 is 77%. Wow. 67% of all births in the state of Texas are in traditional minority communities. What will this state look like in 2040 according to the Census Bureau? This state will be 68% Hispanic. It will be 23% Anglo. It will be 8.1% Asian, it will be 8.5% African American. Now, it just doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if our national party is losing 80% of the minority vote, we may never elect another Republican in my lifetime. And before you think that's an exaggeration, I want you all to think about a few things. Between 1932 and 1964, which is nine presidential elections, quick, how many ones did the Republicans win? Two. Two. Two out of nine. And that was with a war hero, Dwight Eisenhower, who thought about running as a Democrat. If he had run as a Democrat, we'd be 0 for 9. During that time frame, from 1952 to 1994, sorry, 1954 to 1992, Almost four decades, and folks, I don't think I have four decades left, so if we hit another one of these stretches, it means in my lifetime we won't control things. The Democrats controlled the House for 38 years, so for people who say, well, the pendulum will swing back, or it's guaranteed, history doesn't show that. <clears throat> we lost five presidential elections in a row uh, <laughs> during one stretch with four from Roosevelt and one from Truman. Five in a row. We've just lost two in a row now. We have to go another three in a row just to equal what we did a few decades ago. Am I making sense here? Does this scare anybody here? Yes. All right, now, let me tell you why this party has to, if it wants to survive, do better 
in the Hispanic, Asian, and African American communities. And by the way, what is the fastest growing group percentage wise in the state of Texas? No, you're wrong. See, aren't you glad you came? You learned some things. Not even close. Asian Americans in the state have grown from 3.3 to 5.5 in the last decade. It means that right now, one out of every 19 of your neighbors is of Asian descent. And by 2040, the Texans of Asian descent will equal the te Texans who are African American. Wow. That group, uh, ethnic group, voted 70% for Republicans 20 years ago and voted 77% Democrat this time. Well, we've asked them because we've had a lot of meetings and we just chartered our first statewide uh, Asian auxiliary. Number one reason they tell us, and this is what his, uh, African Americans tell us, and uh, we're doing much better in the Hispanic community. Republicans don't show up. They say they, they never see Republican elected officials or party officials or, for that matter, any of y'all, Republican activists. They don't see them at their, their meetings. And the Democrats are there all the time. So what can you not expect somebody to do if you want them to vote for you? Vote for you if you haven't asked them for their vote. You can't expect communities to vote for our party if we're not there. You have to be in those communities. Even if you're in the communities, do you think they'll vote for you if they think you, they don't, you don't like them or you're not welcoming them? The answer is no, of course not. And we've done polling on this. We've done focus groups in Texas. Nationally, we've done it. The answers all come all back the same. Republican Party's never there. Republican candidates are not there. We think the Republican Party's for white people. They don't want people of diverse. And, and that's one of the things we're fighting. So let me tell you a few more things on why this is so important, and then I'll give you some good news and tell you what we can do about this and how we can win elections. <clears throat> to tell you how dramatic a few percentage points can make in changes of demographics, I want to look at this last election. And before I do that, I'll just point out, in 1976, the percentage of voters that were Caucasian in the United States that voted was 89%. 1976, 89%. 2008, 74%. 2012, 72%. And, it's, and by the way, 40 years from now, there will be no majority minority. I mean, there will be no majority. There will only be minorities. Every group, every ethnic group will be uh, a minority. Now to show you what that difference of 2% makes, you, you, we lost 80% of the minority vote. Any Aggies in here? Okay, I'm gonna go real slow on the math there. I got you out there, one Wally. I can't believe you fell for that. I feel like I gave an Aggie sign in your office. I'm, I'm very sensitive because at the SREC meeting they played the Aggie War Hymn. They did that weird thing where they they got up and locked arms. And Harris County, I agreed to put a picture of Kevin Sum in my office for a year if they'd give three thousand dollars to the county party, and they did it. So. Um, that's my little revenge. All right. If you take 2%, that's just the change in demographics in one election cycle, and will you lose 80% of that 2%, 80% of 2% is 1.6. Everybody follow me? But it's really not 1.6, it's 3.2. Because if you take 1.6 from your side and give it to the other side, it's 3.2. Everybody with me? <clears throat> Anybody remember what we, when I said at the first part of this speech on why we lost? What was the margin? 3.8. So almost the entire margin of the popular vote is just the difference of that 2% change in demographics. You all see now why it's so important you can't lose. 77% of the Asian community, 71% of the Hispanic community, and 96% of the African American community. You just can't win elections. It's gonna get harder and harder and harder. Now, now that's the bad news, that we're not doing what we need to do nationally. But let me give you some hope, let me give you some good news, let me tell you what we're doing about it, let me tell you where Battleground Texas and Democrats, I think, have made some miscalculations and why we can remain a competitive state. This is not a solid Republican state. This is a competitive state. But we have been winning the competition. Because one of the reporters asked me, so well you say it's competitive and then, then later you point out you win everything. That's the point. 
it's like watching a boxing match. I used to manage fighters. It was like watching a boxing match. Your fighter could lose every round closely for 12 rounds. You follow me? He's really, or she, she's really in the fight. But the other guy is just slightly better. So at the end of the fight, the score is 12-0. So it looks like a wipeout, right? But it's really, really close, really. That's what we've been doing. We've been winning all the elections so people think we're doing better. Uh, but in reality, we're just winning the competition. It's already competitive. So it's not a question of whether this state will be competitive. This state is already competitive. The question becomes, will the Democrats start winning the competitions? Now, let me give you some good news. I have said repeatedly that we get between mid-30s and low-40s of the Hispanic vote this last election. And, and I think the party changing, its approach to Hispanics, and how we've been outreaching, I can demonstrate through polling and results that it's working. Carl Rove gave a speech in the Georgia party. I didn't know about it until the press called me, because he gave a speech to the Georgia party that said, Georgia party, they want to be successful, so just mimic the Texas GOP, because our candidates get, on average, 40% of the Hispanic vote. So have you all ever heard of political fact check? It's really pretty low. <laughs> so they took that and said, we're going to challenge that. And then they called me and wanted me to contradict Carl. And I, and I was like, no, no, I, I agree with them. And I sent them over data and polls and, and polling we did. But I thought that they would probably come back and say it was false. And the reason I probably thought they would say it was false is I made a similar statement about a year ago when I said that the Republican Party has elected more Hispanic statewide and African American statewide than the Democratic Party. By the way, does that surprise anybody? That's the truth, too. They called and said, where did you get that? Well, I would actually heard it in a speech, so when, I, so, so when they called and said that and wanted the backup on it, I got a little nervous. Because it's like, I hope that's true, because I've been saying it for a year. So I sent my staff to the uh, Texas records. It was absolutely true. We were able to document it. I sent it over there. So what do you think the Austin American Pravda um, <coughs> printed as to whether my statement was true or not? They said it was mostly true. And I'm like, how can that be mostly true? It is either true or not true. You know what the reasoning was? It shows you what we battle with the media. The reasoning was, I didn't point out that we have, only Republicans have been elected statewide over the last 20 years, so it's really unfair to the Democrats to make that point, since they didn't have an opportunity to elect any. <laughs> I was like, what happened between Reconstruction and 1994? They had 100 years to do some elections. So when they're doing this story, I figured they'd come back and say, you know, it wasn't true. Go look at Sunday's Austin American Statements political fact. Judge that statement that the average Republican in Texas gets 40% today of the Hispanic vote as mostly true. Which, as you know, mostly true means true after the story I just told you. It's a great analysis. They had some polls uh, there. I didn't know, for example, Kay Barely Hutchinson gets 49% of the Hispanic vote before she retires. So we have been getting about and what I gave them was poll results recently. We, our bottom of our ticket's been getting uh, mid-30s, like 35, 36, and then the top of our ticket uh, is slightly over 40. So this whole perception in the press that, re, that and, and what the Democrats are counting on, is that Hispanics overwhelmingly vote Democratic. So all they have to do is register Hispanic voters, and then they win. Well, that goes out the window if we're doing 60-40. I mean, we'd like to get up to 50, but that goes out the window at 60-40. Probably even goes out the window at 65-35. So what have we been doing that works, and can we keep doing it? Well, the answer is that we have been spending time um, through auxiliaries. We have four statewide auxiliaries that are Hispanic. We have a full-time uh, Hispanic outreach director. We when our Hispanic candidates run, we encourage them, we mentor them, we make sure they have the money to run. Uh, but most importantly, we send, the, we send out the message that we, we welcome everybody. Uh, this is a party of opportunity. 
And then we try to promote uh, our rising stars. Like there's a fellow named J.M. Lozano. J.M. came to me and he said he's a, he's a sitting Democrat. He could get reelected as a Democrat. You know, you always have some folks that come to you that after they can't get reelected as a Democrat, I don't need to go there, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Well, I had two Hispanic legislators, one who, if he switched to Republican, would lose, and the other, if he switched to Republican, would be iffy. So when somebody does that, that's telling me they're speaking from their heart, right? The first one's Aaron Pena. He could have gotten reelected every time he wanted to. He knew when he switched to the Republican Party, that was the end of it. So he didn't even run again. And the other was J.M. Lozano, who could have run again and could have won again. But both of these people came to me and said the same thing to me. Look, we're really pretty conservative. We're forced to vote for the Democratic leadership. It's getting harder and harder. My conscience bothering me. <clears throat> I don't think I'm a Democrat. If I switch to the Republican Party because I can't support these values that the Democrats are doing, would y'all welcome me? Because I've been heard y'all don't like Hispanic people. And people, no, this, this, these are conversations, I'm just telling you. That y'all aren't welcoming and y'all are against Hispanic people. And I'm like, no, no. I, I, Trust us, and, and, and we had a lot of conversations. If you talk to Aaron today, he's very happy about his party switch. Uh, he, said he's, he said he's been felt more welcome in the Republican Party than he ever did in the Democratic Party because so many of them used to pressure him to try to vote ways he didn't want to vote. And J.M. Lozano, same thing. J.M.'s 32 years old, just turned 32. He owns six wing stops. He's an entrepreneur. Very articulate. He switched. Two Republicans got in thought they could knock him off in the primary as a party switcher. He won tough primary. Then he runs against a Democrat who used to be a state rep, so a solid opponent. He's behind in early voting, so it looks like he's going to lose, but he's a hard worker. He gets out there and knocks on doors, squeaks by, beats the former Democratic incumbent in a district that's 63% Hispanic, and becomes our first legislator to win a majority Hispanic district. And also will tell you he's so happy that he switched to Republican. He's told me he feels free. He feels like he can finally be himself and vote. Something else I'll give you is good news. <clears throat> we polled Hispanic voters that just voted in 2012. You'll see a lot of stuff in the media about people just polled. Uh, but a lot of their polls, like there's one group that just polled, they polled last month. You cannot get accurate data for people that voted in November if you poll them in April or May. You can't get accurate data when you don't find out you're, only, you're not polling people who voted, you're polling all voters. <clears throat> what we did is we got the actual voter lists, called them, asked if they were of Hispanic descent. If they weren't, that was the end of the call. If they wanted to do the poll in Spanish, we did that because one of the things that the Democrats say our polls aren't any good is because it shows you how prejudiced they are against Republicans, as if we don't know that we could have somebody that speaks Spanish to them if they wanted to. They, said, well, they just said, well, we, you know, Republicans don't ask questions in Spanish. Well, actually, we do. So we had Hispanic, I mean, we had Spanish and English speakers, and we polled people who voted in November 12th who said they were of Hispanic descent. Those poll numbers are so encouraging not only in terms of the size of the vote we got, which actually went up since 2008, but more importantly on the issues. 44% of Hispanic voters that just voted self-identify as conservative. Only 18% self-identify as liberal. Over 60% identify, as almost two-thirds identify themselves as pro-life, pro I mean, just go down the list. When we gave them generic statements of what we believe and the Democrats believe on an overwhelming majority of the issue, an overwhelming majority of Hispanic voters that voted picked the Republican position. <clears throat> Even on immigration, it listed as the seventh most important issue. Only 3% of Hispanic voters said it was the number one issue. Now, and I'm just having a frank talk here, if you ask those same voters that you're going to go and deport anybody that's here illegally, it goes off the chart that they say they'll never vote Republican again. However, if you ask them, would you be favor a legal program for a guest worker program, not path to citizenship, and you have to get in the back of the line, 
majority support the Republican position on that, which is counter to what the media portrays. So if, we're, if we are getting Hispanic voters agree with us on the majority of issues, why is it we didn't get a majority of the vote, even though we got a significant? So we asked them that too. And it basically was the number one reason that the Republican Party, there was an unfavorable opinion, was that Hispanic voters, by a large majority, thought the Republican Party basically was not welcoming to Hispanics. So that's something we need to work on. But we're making good progress. We elected this last time. By the way, did any of y'all see the press article about the Republican Party elects a record number of Hispanics? I didn't think so. Um, we increased the number of Hispanic Republican office holders from 58 to 78 just in the last election. We had 600 new Hispanic delegates, uh, delegates of Hispanic descent to our state convention. Five of our incoming 23 SREC of Hispanic descent. I bet you didn't see that in the newspaper either. Uh, because one of the things we battle is the media constantly uh, feeding this, you're anti this, you're anti this, you're anti this. You know, really all we're anti is anti-government tyranny, but that gets lost in the message. So, we know what we need to do. So what are we going to do? What are the, what's the other side doing? Well, the other, other side, under the premise that all they need to do is get a higher percentage of Hispanic voters, is focusing their efforts on what are called low propensity voters, voters, people that are here, that are legally entitled to vote, that aren't registered and don't vote. And they're focusing a lot of their efforts on the Hispanic community as well as college campuses, et cetera. So what's their game plan? Their game plan is to hold a six-week school this summer to hire 250 people from this, these schools full-time, 250 people full-time, paying them $15 to $25 an hour, and put them out in the field. They all get like 10 people under them. Their goal is to get 500,000 people recruited that they can identify as new voters and working uh, with special emphasis on some of the uh, the minority communities and the college campuses where they think they have target-rich environments and eventually turn the state uh, democratic. You can't underestimate what they're doing because if you told me somebody was going to spend 10 million and that's the figure they use and Moiston in, in the paper said he would make sure that they raise the 10 million a year, if you have an organization spending 10 million a year that's putting 200 people out in the field, you have to take that seriously. On the other hand, I tell people don't overstate their importance. Because they, they give a lot of play to, oh, we had 14 city tour, there was 200 people at this meeting. Well, the same week they did that, people kept calling me. By the way, let me save you all some time. You do not need to call the state party headquarters and say, Steve, do you know there's a group called Battleground Texas? I just want to save you all from doing that. <laughs> In fact, if, keep, if people keep doing it, I'm thinking about charging a dollar for that as a new fundraiser for the state party. <laughs> yes, we know about them. Because they have public meetings. Now, I never tell people to go to their meetings. Um, <clears throat> but people, some people have, and they, they've reported what they've said. But they basically say what they're going to say in the... Uh, Press. By the way, they come to our meetings, like in the Dallas County, <clears throat> they sent people there, they have recordings, they put out a press release attacking what a Tea Party leader said. So, you know, from here on it's game on in the sense that there may be somebody here in this room right now recording. That's just what they do. They record, they take a snippet, and then they take it out of context, and then they put it out there. <clears throat> but if you put 250 out there, you can't underestimate that. But don't overestimate it, because one of the things I told the press is to think about this. They're going to spend $10 million a year. That is a good amount of money. But they don't have any candidates. <laughs> Quick, who's running for governor as a Democrat? Who's running for the U.S. Senate as a Democrat? Who's running for lieutenant governor as a Democrat? Anybody know who's, who might run for governor as a Republican? Okay, that's right. Greg Abbott, anybody else? Tom Hawken. Tom Hawken? All right, y'all know that. Anybody know who's running for lieutenant governor as a Republican? Staples, Patterson, Dewhurst, Dewhurst, Patrick. Okay, y'all knew them all. Does anybody know a Democrat running? 
I told the press, you can spend $100 million. If you don't have a candidate, it won't work. They kind of got it backwards. <laughs> you get the candidate first, and then you build the organization. It's not like the field of dreams. Build it and they will come. Doesn't work that way. The other thing you need to... So they're going to lose every election. I'll just make a prediction right now. I'm going to go out on a limb. The Republican Party will win the governorship, will win the U.S. Senate, will win the lieutenant governorship, will win the controller, will win the AG, will, will, will win the land commissioner, will win the railroad commissioners. The only place we might be vulnerable is on the statewide judicials, but I'd say we still got a good chance to hold those. So what happens next election cycle after you spend $10 million and all the people are fired up and you've got nothing to show for it? How many of those people will stay around? Don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. But here's the other thing. Our candidates are going to spend tens of millions of dollars. Greg Abbott has 18 million in the bank. He'll probably spend 30 to 50 million. They're hiring 50 field people right now for campaign to be named later, right? They're already hiring 50 field people. So we have all these campaigns that are going to spend tens and tens of millions of dollars. They go do organizing. They get people involved. So when you hear the other side's doing 10 million, yeah, take it seriously. But on the other hand, don't get too freaked out about it because our side's going to end up spending a couple hundred million. So I hope that makes you all feel a little better about that. The, the other thing is they make a big deal about how many people show up for a meeting. Like they call and say, well, I had 250 people in Dallas. I said, yeah, do you know that same week I was at the Dallas County Reagan Lincoln Day dinner? And there was 950 people there. I said, we just don't put out bulletins all the time every time we have a meeting and saying we have another 200 people there. Because we always have 200 people there. I mean, y'all have 100 here tonight. How many times y'all meet? Once a month? Once a week. Once a week. So I count y'all as 400 a month? <laughs> But they're making a big deal that for the first time in 10 years, people showed up at a meeting. Let's see if they're there the next month or the next quarter, let alone. Now they may be, but I'm just saying before people take it too much, remember, we meet all the time. And the best example I can give you is this. Our state convention, over 9,000 delegates and alternates registered by the final Saturday. There was another thousand or so registered as guests, and then we had vendors, elected official staff, probably put us around 10, 11,000. Did y'all see the Democratic State Convention? It was pathetic. There was like three or 4,000 showed up. So before I'm gonna to get too excited about them having a few hundred people here and a few hundred people there, let's see how many people show up at the State Convention. Unless they get over 10,000, it means we still have more people than they do. Now, it's not a reason for us to relax. I just wanna put it all in perspective. So where do we need to go from here and what do we need to do to win? And in addition to the problems with uh, attracting minority voters, what are the other problems of party face? Well, the digital software system sucked. Excuse my language. Did y'all know what Orca is? Yeah. Orca was the Romney. Yeah. You know what it stood for? They picked Orca because Orca is like the killer whale. Yeah, I call it the beach whale pro project. because they. Our side invested millions of dollars on a program that didn't work. But the other side had four years of running a 50 straight state strategy. And that's something that people miss. Our candidate, we don't even know who our candidate is until after the convention. Or they're not officials after the convention. So the other side has 50 states manning it year after year. And they have superior digital uh, platforms. And that has an effect on it. But in addition to losing 80% of the minority vote, another huge factor, this is just my own opinion, is you are really limited as a party as to who will follow you by who leads you. And if you have a charismatic, articulate, popular, great campaigner, you're going to do better than if you don't. That's just the truth. And most elections are not decided by conservatives or liberals. Conservatives generally vote for the Republican Party, and liberals generally vote for the Democratic Party. So who are elections generally decided by? The middle. I don't even call them moderates. There are a lot of, a lot of people that are just non-ideological. 
<clears throat> because really, if you're conservative, how could you ever even think about voting for a Democrat? And if you're a socialist, how could you ever think of voting for anything other than the Democratic Party, right? <laughs> so anybody with any ideology has already gone to one party or the other. But there's just a lot of people in between. I know people like this. You probably know people. I'm not really into that much. I vote for the person I like. I've heard people say, oh, I can't vote for Governor Christie because he's too fat. I say, I can't vote for Governor Christie because he gave a bear hug to the president the last week. Well, that's right, you know. Actually, I'm supposed to be neutral. Um, I have problems with Governor Christie because he gave a, a bear hug to the president the last week of the campaign. So, he's still doing it. Yes, he is. But a smaller version of him is doing that. You know they're serious about running for president when they get lap band surgery. Uh, so, the reason I, if you really want to know what I think the single greatest factor that we could have to turn our party around and therefore turn the country around is who we nominate in 2016. And I want you all to think about something. Did President Obama, when he was running the first time, ever stand up and say, I am the most socialistic candidate in the race. I am going to make sure we try to socialize medicine. We're going to try to get government intrusion in your life on your emails. We're going to spy on you. We're going to have the IRS come target you. We're going to increase the size of government so that our debt's going to go up 65% in five. Did he say any of this? Well, if you listen. But he never said he was the most socialistic president, right? But if you look at his score in the National Journal, the National Journal, which is not a Republican conservative uh, publication, ranks the U.S. senators and gives them a score prior to the 2008 election. The second most liberal senator, who was very upset that he wasn't the most liberal senator, scored was the only avowed socialist in the U.S. Senate. And I'm not saying that uh, being melodramatic. He says he is a socialist. He's not even the Democratic nominee. His name is Bernie Sanders from the state of Vermont. He runs as an independent. And he says, I am the only socialist, he thought, in the U.S. Senate. Because he was number two, according to the National Journal. Number one was Barry. Barack Obama. So but my whole point is this, this was his record before he ran, but he didn't run as the most liberal guy. How did he get elected? There's no red states, there's no blue states, there's just the United States of America. And we're going to end all this bickering. I'm going to reach across the aisle and it's going to be bipartisan. We're all going to have a kumbaya. And we're going to talk to Iran and talk to North Korea and they're going to do what they want because it's really been our fault that they've been developing nuclear weapons. Right? He gave, he gave the kids, the young people, hope. We're going to put you to work. Remember this one? Health care costs too much. We're going to reduce your premiums. Right? Of course you're fear Obamacare if you thought, you thought your premiums were going to go down. Never mind the fact that they're going up 2500 uh, per person. But that's what he got elected on. But he got elected that way because he was charismatic and articulate. And he brings the people in between. When Reagan ran, and I was <clears throat> involved in the Reagan 76 and 80 campaigns, I was the statewide youth chairman in 80, he didn't come in and say, I am a right-wing extremist, I want to take the gun. Now, the media said that about him, <clears throat> but he didn't. In fact, he said, I want to reach across the aisle. He said, I'm going to get union laborers, uh, union, I'm going to get Democrats, independents. He built a coalition, and he painted a picture of hope and optimism and he was articulate, and he was charismatic, and he was good looking. And you know what? People believed him, and I think they believed him rightly so, because he was sincere and heartfelt. And he and he, he gave a pic people a picture of America that people wanted to follow. And I point all that out because we could have the greatest software in the world and the greatest organization in the world, but if the party nominates a turkey, you know, we're gonna get our goose cooked. I think I mixed my metaphors on that. But. So I think that that is a huge thing we need to do. So what else do we need to do? Well, we need to, the one time, I can't believe I'm saying this even. It's like, I think God's going to come down and strike me with lightning bolt. I actually agree with Howard Dean on one thing. I know, isn't he so obnoxious? Don't you just want to turn the TV off when you see him on it? But the one thing I have to say he was right about is he said we needed a, the Democrats needed a 50-state strategy. He did this years ago. 
and that they needed to work on Repu uh, Republican states over a long-term period of time. It kind of reminded me of like the Vietnamese, the, uh, the, the, the socialist Vietnamese and communists. You know, they just did it from a generation. They were going to generation, you know, they beat the French and they beat us. And they, they looked at the long view to take things over. There's a reason why I kind of mentioned the socialists with Howard Dean, but we'll let that go. But anyways, they, they were taking the long view. And the 50 state strategy means you compete in every state even if you're losing now to build for the future. And you have offices there, and you have people there, and you build. And it's worked. Because I'm going to name some states that Ronald Reagan won, that we had won in a quarter century, and we call them swing states now, but they're really not, because when you lose them for a quarter century, they're democratic states. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, California. Now we're losing Florida. Those are all swing states. Colorado was a Republican state. And we keep saying we're going to go battle in Michigan and battle in Ohio and battle in... Uh, uh, actually, we've won Ohio in the last 20... That's a bad example. But, but Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania... We haven't, won those, we haven't won those states in a quarter century. California. And think about something else. California, New York, Texas... Florida and Pennsylvania represent roughly two-thirds of the electoral votes you need to win. So there's almost no margin for error if we lose Texas. You have to win everything, which is not realistic. We have 38 electoral votes. If those switch, it's a difference of 76. We're going to get two more at the next census, so then that's going to be 40, and if it switches eight, we're going to make that up. So. We need to do what they are doing. We need to start now with a 50-state strategy. You need to have offices open the entire time, and you need to work year-round. So I've had my differences with the RNC. Those on the SRC know that uh, there is a reason why the state delegation was 32 miles from the convention out in the middle of nowhere in Florida, and why we were put in the back of the convention hall with an obstructed view of the stage. So I and I'm, one of the reasons is I was only one of four people to, of 168 to vote against the budget in 2010 because when I did my calculations I thought the National Party would end up 17 million in debt and I thought that was pretty ironic that the Party of Fiscal Responsibility couldn't balance its own checkbook. But I was wrong; it only ended up 26 million in debt. But anyways, <coughs> so I tell you that to tell you that I have not been shy to be critical of the RNC, but when they do some things right and they finally get it, I want to give them credit for it. And they now agreed to do some things that I want to give them credit for. They're going to put 200 full-time people out in the field. They're going to start doing a 50-state 50 50 state strategy. They're going to invest 15 to 20 million in getting us a new digital platform. And as I mentioned earlier, the greatest thing that Democrats ever did for me was to give me some articles that I could bombard the RNC with. You need to pay attention. Because I've been saying for three years this is a competitive state. They wouldn't pay attention. Now they're paying attention. We're getting 21 full-time paid staffers by the RNC to come down and help us. And we're working. Uh, we're going to have victory centers that they're going to pay for five or six around the state. They'll be up year-round. And that's, that's going to be a big help. And so we're... We're going to, starting this summer, we're already interviewing uh, and to put people around so that we can do on the ground some of the things the Democrats. Now, we're not going to have 250 paid people, I'll just tell you right then. We're not a FDR jobs work program. But I would take two dozen paid people to coordinate the volunteers we have over 250 paid people any day of the week. So I'm actually optimistic that we're we're going to make some progress over the next. And then finally, uh, I'll just leave this thought with you, and then I'm happy to answer any questions about the RNC, state convention, anything, that come, anything that's coming to your mind. <clears throat> Despite my show telling you that we were going down from 2000 to 2008, I didn't tell you what's happened since then. What's happened since then is that we have... We elected several hundred new Met Republicans in 2010. And some people said, well, that was a wave year, so that's the reason. 
But if that was the case, how do you explain that in 2012, we elected another net increase over 2010 of 241 Republicans? So that as I am sitting here today, there are 800, at least 815, I say at least because we had some party switches in the last month and I haven't calculated up, but we have at least 815 more Republicans elected statewide today than we did in two election cycles ago. I'd also like to point out that I was the chairman during the last two elections. I don't know that. So we, have, we are now, we were at about 45% of the elected officials in 2008. Today we're 61% of the elected officials. So we can win this competition, but it's going to take all of us working. We need to get back out in the neighborhoods because all this fancy stuff is just a tool to get to know your neighbor and go talk to them and persuade them and turn out. And in fact, Jim Messina, the campaign manager, said he thought the irony of all this digital stuff is we're going to be so digitized that over time it's not going to work. It's really basically to get information to go talk to your voters next door. So eventually we'll probably be back to the way it was in the 60s where everybody's relying on door to door. So I just look at it as the Republican Party just skipped a step in between and we'll just go back to what we were doing before. But we absolutely can win this competition. But it takes everybody getting out and working it takes an honest discussion about the state of our party and what communities we're not in that we need to go into. And the final thing I would say is this. Fight all you want in the primary. So the Democrats do it. If you're a good Republican, I say your only choice is in the primary. So there's nothing wrong with a good primary fight. But when it's over, you got to get together and try to get the, 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 the fellow or the lady elected in the fall. Otherwise, you're going to have a Democrat. And I, I tell people, it'd be like if Teddy Roosevelt let his Rough Riders have fistfights before they ran up the hill, <clears throat> they might not have been in any shape to take the hill. So let's wait till we take the hill before we start fighting each other. We can fight each other, but let's take the White House, the Senate, and the House. Then we can decide what we're doing among ourselves. But right now is not the time to do it. It's okay in the primaries. Nothing wrong with it. Matter of fact, I, that's where our choice is. But we have to do what the Democrats do and be ready for battle in the fall. And with that, we, we, we can be successful. So with that, happy to answer any questions anybody has. Yes, ma'am. Um, all the news, a lot of the news uh, areas that I was talking about, how great Texas is, okay? And how Governor Perry's been going to the east and saying, come on out to Texas, you know, we'll take good care of you. The problem with that, as a former New Yorker, um, I can tell you, you're not going to get a whole lot of Republicans in the county. Uh, how are you going to combat people moving from other states to come out to Texas and get them to be Republican rather than the Democrats that are all leaving states like New York, like California? I'm more Californians here than I ever thought possible. You know? Well, that, that's a great question. Did you all hear that question? Yeah. Okay. Several points, because you raise many issues, and they're very valid issues. First of all, between 2000 and 2010, 6 million people increase in our population of 6 million for Texas. That is more than the population of over 20 states. So it's like 20 complete other states coming in or being wow. born. But a lot of it is moving. We had Over a decade, we had over 800,000 job seekers come in, and that didn't count their families. We've had, in the last five years, 352,000 political and economic refugees just from California alone. <laughs> I call them the economic boat people. <laughs> but, but here's the problem. You're not, you have no um, guarantee that even though they're coming to the state because the state offers opportunity that they understand that the reason why that opportunity is here is because of conservative government. And so I am worried about it. Um, so what are we going to do about it? Um, I'm being very careful about what I say since our governor is out campaigning for people to come here. Um, well, let me put it this way. First of all, I am not telling my friends to move to Texas from other states. And, but the serious answer to that is we actually, through the RNC now, track people moving into the state. It's called the movers list. And it's now um, 
matched up against the database so we can tell basically if they're Democrat, Independent, or Republican. And part of this victory effort, once it gets going, is, and it's not going yet, we're just in the interview stage, and, and it's going to be phased in over a year. There's going to be uh, 12 of those people hired this year, another nine um, first part of next year, and the center's probably by the end of the year. But once things are up and running, the idea is that we can contact those that have a Republican history and an independent history, the Republicans to contact, to get them engaged, get them registered, make sure they're in our data banks to turn out, the independents to start re-educating them, kind of like have re-education camps about free enterprise and things like that. Oh, it's a joke, I'm probably being recorded. <laughs> That's gonna be on Battleground, Texas, isn't it? So that's a party chairman calls for re-education camps. Yeah, we have to make them read Ayn Rand and uh, Adam Smith and the Constitution, little things like that. Um, but anyways, Democrat, but then we're gonna leave the Democrats alone because you don't flip the other side. So we are gonna do that. Um, but I think the other part of the side of it is, and it's going to have to come through our candidates, we need to have our candidates, when they run their ads, talk about the Texas miracle. And we have just so much to say. Over the last 10 years, we have a net increase of 1,082,000 jobs, number one in the country. We've been the number one job creator over the last few years. California almost caught us last year. They had 252 to our 62. But when you come from way down to the bottom, it's easier to go back up, and we've already been growing. The other thing is they've got about 50% more population than we do, and yet we still beat them. But we have been below the national average in unemployment consistently for the last decade. California has been above. Um, we never really had the housing crisis that other people had in the other part. We really didn't have much of an economic dip here. Our economy grew over a 10-year period of time, 93%. The average state grew 66%, so that means we have a 50% higher growth rate than the average state. So that's the miracle to tell. The other side is to say what our environment is that created that in in environment. We're 47th out of 50 in taxes per capita. Only one of seven states with no state income tax. We're 47th out of 50 in spending per capita. Now, I wouldn't mind being 50 out of 50. Uh, Representative Toth is working on that. I saw him. Uh, <laughs> By the way, y'all have a really nice guy back there. We like nice him. to me, not nice to the to the Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> That's, why That's why you put him there. Do a great job, and thank you for coming here tonight, sir. Uh, but we have to tell that story. We basically have to tell the story through our candidates that we have a good situation. Please don't muck it up. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that's uh, been on the news recently is uh, our good friend Kathleen Sevillas, the head of human services, going out there and uh, telling the little girl she needs to die that she doesn't uh, deserve any adult lungs because she isn't on the proper list. I was thinking that would make an excellent ad for the Republicans to attack the Democrats with, kind of like the Goldwater ads with the nuclear bombs. And it's one of those touchy feely ads that are going to appeal to the, the women world. behind you are all shaking their heads no. saying, no, that will backfire. No. Absolutely backfire. Yeah. Absolutely backfire. I'm going to stay out of that one. <laughs> but, but I will make a point that, that, that I think is a good point to make. No, I, I, no I, I'm with you, but I also think the other concern is that if people think you're using a child for your political gain, that can back back. Well, they do it all the time. Well, we can't do it? No. Why well, since it's <coughs> well, never stupid. to the level of the country. Well, 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 let's, no, let's talk about a winning strategy. To me, this is a winning strategy. I would like to see our future 2016 candidate take all the things that were promised by the Democrats. Rob, to me, Romney did not do a good case of this. And point out how they were an absolute failure on everything they promised. For example, cut the deficit, not the annual deficit, but the deficit by 50% in four years, when the deficit will be $25 trillion by 2013. That the price of medical care would go down when now it's the Governor Accounting Office estimates it's up by 2,500. That we would have a safer world with North Korea and Iran, which we obviously don't. And we'd have the most transparent government in the history. Yeah, that gets last. Now, we, this, now when you repeat what they say, it even sounds funny. It's so ludicrous, isn't it? But this was a guy that was going to have the highest ethical standards 
Now it turns out that he, he did a little caveat. He said, what I meant to say is I was going to have the highest ethical standard since Nixon. But, <laughs> still didn't make it. No, he's, he's, he's bumping up there. Um, so I, that'd be one thing. It's, it's just to show demonstrably, just through facts, that you know everything they promised didn't occur. The other thing is, and this ties into uh, Sibelius and, and that argument, is I think even though most people aren't ideological, and those of us that are conservative, well, let me just ask you, I'll tell you what my philosophy as government is, and let's see if anybody agrees with this. I am a huge believer in, in what George Washington said. I think it, he gave us great advice, and it summed up everything you need to know about government and how to act and what our philosophy should be. He said, government is like fire. It's a dangerous servant and a fearful master. And I think even, you all agree with that? Yeah. Now, I didn't say that you can't, you don't need a servant. I mean, you need government, but you've got to be careful about it because it can get out of control. But I think most people are not ideological. They don't go around thinking about the Constitution and all this. But I think the average American today gets it when they hear a low-level person who didn't even graduate from high school say he's one of 8,000 people that have clearance that could get anybody's email and go through it. So I, I think that the, just kind of this big government and these scandals, the idea that the IRS could target somebody just because they don't like them or official doesn't like them or they have the wrong, I think that sends chills down people's spine. But yeah, not even, but I, I'm not even talking about ideology. I just think the average American gets it that it is a scary proposition that the IRS can use tax returns as a weapon. I think the average American gets it that if you give the government the power, and I don't think most people knew this, I didn't know this, that every one of our phone calls has been recorded in, in a huge center. I, I didn't know that, that they were recording every time somebody calls everybody, and they can call it up. And you tie it to the Sibelius, that the government, <clears throat> A government that's, when you see the example that they're deciding who's basically living, dying, and sometimes what seemingly are irrational, arbitrary um, measures, I think you can, enough of this hits a critical mass where we can also repackage our party as we are the party looking out for individual freedoms for people. We are the party that is going to protect you from a government that's too powerful and too strong to do these things. And I think if we do that, Combine it with showing where the Democrats failed, and in our economic, we become the party of prosperity. I think we have a winning message. I think it's a wrong message to couch that in just talking about we want to do tax cuts on uh, the upper income, because all that happens is people think you're just talking about rich people. I think we need to repackage it as we are for growth and opportunity and individual freedom and protecting rights and, and all that, and I think we might get a winning strategy. Again, if you have the candidate who can deliver that message. Yes, ma'am. You were talking about messaging and a winning strategy. What is the state strategy to um, to get that message out through the media? Do you have someone driving that boat? What's going to be different now than it was before? Because as you were saying, it's a problem. Yeah, great question. I don't know if you know what, what the state party is going to do on, on the messaging. One of the things we're getting from the national office is a full-time uh, digital communication specialist. And we're supposed to, that's targeted for September 1st. We already have a full-time communications. <clears throat> you mentioned that our Facebook, I think, has 21 or 2, 22,000. When I took over, it was just in the teams. So we, we've been able to up it. But also, you have to remember, our demo, we, we need younger people, but our demographics still, some of the older people, uh, our average delegate is 58. Our average, um, the average party contributor is, anybody want to guess? Oh, that's way too young, 63. <laughs> 70. 48.5% of our contributors are over 70. 95% of our contributors are over 50. The average convention delegate is 58. <clears throat> so, what are you going to do? But the reason I that's point bad. Out, no, it is. And that's why, that's that's why for example, we, we, we founded a high school Republican state auxiliary. has 22 chapters now in one year. I'm going to the first state Republican high school convention this next weekend, 
We have a college newspaper that's called the New Texas Forum that young people write for. We do pay attention to the digital on the Facebook. We put out the, 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 uh, the tweets and all that. The only reason I, I, I mentioned the old folks and the Facebook is you still have to understand that some of our base is older than the Democratic base so they don't use that. Uh, it's just true. And I mean, we have people that still don't want to use the internet to sign up for the convention, so we have to get over that hurdle. Um, and that's true. But having said that, what is not known is that we had over 100,000 on our email list a year ago, and we cleaned it out regularly. These are people that, unless you've opened that email in the last couple, three months, they get rid of you. So we culled it back down to 50, and now it's built back up to 75,000. So you only see 21,000 on the Facebook, but there are actually 75,000 households getting regular communications from us that we send out all the time. We also do things like tele tele statewide teleconferences with our contributors and supporters. We invite as many as 70,000 people to those. I did it as an experiment. None of this had been done before. Um, to see if 1,000 people would get on. The first one had like 6,500 people on. The second one had like 7,500 people on. That's a lot of people to be on for an hour. So we're doing those types of things. But the RNC is going to give us somebody that just specializes in the digital. By the way, I might mention, and maybe you all didn't know this, but when I walked in the door, there was no youth director. When I walked in the door, there was no political director. When I walked in the door, there was nobody signed to work the Hispanic community. When I walked in the door, there was not a finance director to raise money. When I walked in the door, the party was $708,451 in debt, not that anybody's counting, had been in debt for 18 years, was losing 90000 a month. And again, as I said, the Democrats had elected more people in 2008, the election before I got there. So Rome isn't built in the day. You know, first, we had to get rid of the debt. That debt was paid off in five and a half months. We have been debt-free, meaning zero. We don't even, when I say debt-free, I'm not talking about long-term debt. We pay every bill to zero at the end of the month. We have had a zero balance since November of 2010, every month. The minimum amount of money we've had in all our accounts since then is 500000 and I'm happy to report now for nine months in a row after we paid our bills, we've had a balance of a million or more. Last year we raised 6.6 .6 million. The year before I got there, the party brought in about 2.3 million. So we can't do everything all at once, but we're now beginning to be able to do some things. So we had a, we, let me just give you some examples we've had. We have a full-time youth director who now works for the college Republicans, the young Republicans, and high school Republicans. We have active chapters here. We've now uh, chartered four statewide Hispanic groups. We have an African American, I just came from a meeting with our African-American leadership in Harris County. We have funded, the state party has funded giving them grants. We're about to give them another grant with the RNC. There are, we've identified 197,000 African-American households uh, that, either, that either vote Republican or don't vote in the Democratic primary or swing voters. We're targeting those. Um, there's 2,000 hardcore Republican households in the African American community that almost always vote Republican. We're going to start off by contacting them directly. These are things that hadn't been done before. Uh, we've made a list of all the Hispanic households that we think voted Republican and we reached out to them. So these are things that we're doing that we're, that we're building upon. Uh, but it, it takes time. Uh, I've been state chairman for uh, it will be 36 months on Thursday. <laughs> Not that anybody's counting, but it's 1,094 days I've been chairman. And I have, hold on a second, uh, I'll get this right here, C364, C363, 62. I have 361 days left, now that anybody's counting. Okay, we have a bunch of votes. All right, yes sir, in the back. Yeah, when you go up and you talk to all these candidates, they'll be running with tens of millions of dollars. What happens with all of that or it appears to us is it all goes through consultants where they take out their piece and they do this carpet bombing and over and over and over again. And we haven't been in a fight yet. That we haven't been outspent 10 to 1. And we won them all. So somehow this has to get to people that the way to win elections is down here. And you're talking about it and we would appreciate anything that you can say to these people Get involved with these people. Well, did y'all hear his question? 
Let me break that down to the National Party and the State Party. The National Party was very consultant driven, and they used a company called FLS that had a $64 million contract. I, I, I'm going to be an optimist and just say losing, hopefully, was a big eye opener, and it seems to be. Um, also, what seems to be a big eye opener is you can't. This, this is being recorded in the back. Uh, let me just say you can't have people who have never got their fingers dirty knocking on doors uh, or even making telephone calls parachute into states from states that they're not having that they don't have any connection with and act like the smartest guy in the rooms for the volunteers, some of whom have now they're, they're up there on their third or fourth trip to Ohio. You can't do that. So from all accounts of Texans that went to Ohio, Virginia, and Florida, the ground game was grossly deficient. And in the analysis that was done by the RNC, one of the things I got right, there's a lot of stuff in there I disagree with, because there's some stuff in there I agree with, is that the ground game was woefully inadequate. So one of the things they've promised, which in Texas, they, they, I'll give them credit, they are doing this, is that when these hirings are done, they're going to be Texans, or Texas is going to get Texans, Ohio is going to go to Ohioans, Florida is going to, and they're going to talk to the local leadership. They're not going to hire anybody that we don't also interview with them that hopefully will be our local people. So hopefully that will be um, <coughs> improved. On the state level, I don't use consultants. Um, <coughs> with one minor exception in that we brought in somebody to help with the hotel arrangements right before the state convention for about four weeks. But I am pitched by consultants all day long. They come and they want to sell us software, they want, want us to outsource voter ID, they want us to outsource um, our graph, everything. We do that all in-house. We even did our mail in-house. So there are, no, there are no consulting contracts outside of accounting for the state party today. That has not always been so in the past. But that's also one of the reasons we were able to balance the budget. Now, in terms of grassroots, the first election I was there, and we were, I was greatly handicapped by money, I cut the staff to six full-time people, two of which were accounting. So there was only four full-time people for the 2010 election. As compared to next election cycle, we should be up to 33 or 34, and the state has had as many as 72. So to, to put that in perspective, you had 72 at one time, there was 32 in 2008, we did it with six people, two of which were the accounting people. But we made up for it in part by doing the Texas Trailblazers. We had roughly 2,000 volunteers sign up, and we assigned them to campaigns and made sure that they try to turn out, and we did it in targeted districts. And we had three weekends of block walking, and I also asked every staff member to go block walk on those weekends as well to set an example that if we were not asking people to do anything we wouldn't do. And yours truly, the last two election cycles for three weekends in a row, Saturday and Sunday, I've picked um, candidates and I've personally gone out and block walked uh, the day. In fact, uh, I will tell you this, that I was block walking for Francisco Canseco, so he called and said, they said the chairman's the one that comes down, he wants to help, and he'll bring some volunteers. <clears throat> My office calls me in a panic about two hours after I'm block walking, saying, where are you? I said, well, I'm in the hills of San Antonio block walking, why? He said, oh, the Conseco campaign called, they thought that something had happened to you. Because they were, they just, the guy said he's never known a state chairman that's ever block walked, so he thought you were just coming down here to open the headquarters and then you disappeared. They thought something had happened to you. I said, no, we're open the headquarters to go block walk. That means you go block walk. So we're trying. But it, but let me say something else. And again, this is among family, probably not among family completely. No one knows here. But, um, I'm trying to be diplomatic. <laughs> Why? All right, I won't be. Uh, quite frankly, we have some, well, let me preface this by saying, we have some really good precinct chairmen that really work hard, some really good SREC work. Let me recognize the SREC. You, know, you all know Judy and Jim, and y'all raise your hands. We have another one here. Rosemary. Rosemary. They really are a pleasure 
for being to work with and cooperative and hardworking, and thank you all for being here. And Molly, thank you, County Chairman, for being here. We have some ones that are really good and get out and work. <clears throat> but I think also because we've won a lot of elections and there's been perception, we just frankly got some deadwood in our party. And that, that just occupy a position and go to a meeting and don't work. Those days are over if we're going to win elections. So I just tell you, you need to tell people who are in your area, and I'll tell them myself, if you're willing to work, thank you, you need your work, but our party needs to get out in the neighborhoods and go door to door. And if you're not willing to do that, you need to step aside and let somebody else do it. you got to go back and tell them, it's just infighting between Republicans and Tea Party candidates. Right. This has got to stop, really. Right. I mean, Ted Cruz is like a hero to us, and he can be vilified by other Republicans. It's, that's well, let, let me say, no, I, I'm with you, but did y'all hear her comment about Ted Cruz getting vilified? I don't think, y'all correct me if I'm wrong. I may be wrong on this, but I don't think I am. He's not vilified after he got elected by Texas Republicans. No. no. Oh, right. That's why I always say when I talk to people, if we're talking about the party, we need to separate out the state party from the national party. But I, well, we've got a couple of senators that maybe we should collect a retirement fund oh, for uh, <coughs> U.S. Senators, not from our state. But, but let me tell you something, being on the RNC. Uh, <coughs> not, not every state is anywhere close to our state philosophically. And that's just a fact. See, we we're all thinking of we're Republicans or conservative. You know, there's there's a big spectrum when you get on the RNC, and um, there are a lot. And, uh, frankly, I just think a lot of people don't even like Texas, and I think a lot of people are resentful of Texas for a couple of reasons. You know that's why. That's why all well and good. But in the end, that's why the Democrats lose because they all get. Oh, the I agree. Man, and no. These guys just go split apart. No, I mean, the idea that somebody would call, call Rand Paul and Ted Cruz wacko birds, to me, is wacko. Because, for example, the week that uh, uh, Rand Paul stood up spontaneously and said, I'm going to speak till I can speak no more, when I went around the state that week, to TFRW clubs and I mean that's all anybody wanted to talk. He energized our party, yeah. and the fact that you would call him a wacko bird. Now I've known him since he was 18 years old. He's a friend of mine, and when I was in Washington, I stopped by and visited him. I said, "Was that thing really spontaneous?" He says, "Steve, I promise you, because number one, I would have got better shoes, and number two, I would have thought about how to handle this bathroom break problem." And by the way, oh no, turn off the recorder. Obviously. He really said that was the limiting factor to his filibuster. He was just about to burst. <clears throat> but that really was spontaneous, and that's just rant. But the fact is, he got a party that had been, I think, depressed and down and wondering who's going to speak for us. He captured the imagination of the entire country. He even had some liberal Democrats supporting him uh, on the idea of this, uh, you know, killing American citizens without due process. And I think, you know, the talking about the emails and all that. And then Ted Cruz and, and Mike Lee and everybody came down and joined him. I, I think it uh, created an energy for our party that we haven't had in a while. But then where were the Republican fathers who should have immediately approached those senators who belittled another conservative senator in front of every camera possible and said, you do that again and we will pull every dime of funding we have from Yeah, I mean... Well, well, first, first of all, they shouldn't have, they shouldn't have been attacked. They, they should have had people unify with them. But, but here's one of the problems. There's a perception, and sometimes it's with the state party, mainly with the national party, that the party like is sitting there controlling things. When in reality, for the most part, it's not. What's really happening is elected officials are just doing their thing. And you can't get them to do what should be the obvious thing not to do, which is don't go attack your new two most popular senators in the U.S. Senate. I thought money was like a ring of bull's nose. You pull on an arm, that bull will go with you. <laughs> <laughs> 
I got, can I borrow that in my next piece? <clears throat> okay. It is, but you have to understand them. It's about money that you could use that money to entice them. But here's the reality. The Republican National Committee, generally, that's not the funding arm for the U.S. Senators. So, if you look at like the body I'm a part of, the Rams Peepus, people say, well, the National Party should. Well, no, the National Party doesn't have any leverage. The money for the Senators comes from a separate committee that the Senators raise, the Republican National Senatorial Committee. The money for the Congressmen come from a different committee called the Republican National Congressional Committee. Those are not run by the RNC. They have their own chairman, their own board, and the congressmen can raise money for congressmen, and senators can raise money for senators, so we just don't really have a lot of leverage. It's like in the presidential race. It's just, well, they're smart, politically smart, in that they don't want us to have leverage, so what's the way for them to prevent us from having leverage? They set up their own committee. We, they set up these committees. These are senators setting up a joint committee. These are congressmen setting up a committee. So that way they're kind of insulated from it. Uh, but there's another misconception, and that is like the RNC picks the, the presidential candidate. No, the process is flawed that gets us sometimes, I think, a worse candidate than we normally would get. But the RNC really doesn't do anything to pick the candidate. It's just a primary voter. So I write people all the time saying, you're on the RNC, get us a better nominee. And I look, you get us a better nominee. Get, I mean, you're all, you know, we just work for whoever you all get us. But, but we have a, we, well, we, we don't have a say. We didn't have a say last time. There's also misconceptions about that. The reason we didn't have a say last time was not because when our primary was set. Our primary was set for March 8th. If we had had our primary on March 8th, we would have been a big player. The reason we don't have a say is because the Republican Party, me, specifically got sued. I've been sued 17 times since I've been state chairman for this volunteer job. Y'all know I do this full time as a volunteer, right? But I make up for it by getting sued. Uh, <clears throat> I, knew, uh, I knew when I hit, uh, I knew I was state chairman when two weeks into it, when I'm trying to figure out how to keep the party from being evicted and the payroll to be paid, uh, I was sued for the first time two weeks into my being state chairman. Uh, that one was trying to knock Brian Birdwell off the ballot uh, to, so, to sue me uh, to say that I shouldn't certify him for the ballot and uh, saying that he wasn't a resident <coughs> because he was out of the state in Virginia. And I said, uh, I think uh, I'll cut a guy who's had, is out of state because he got burnt to a crisp while he was in the Pentagon and they had to stick, I told him this, they had to stick maggots on his skin to uh, and then dip him in chemical baths like torture, I'm going to give him a little slack. So you go ahead and sue him. And we won that battle, and Brian Birdwell is now a state senator. But the reason I point this all out is they sued me as part of their, the effort to, to redraw the district lines. They sued, the, they sued me in my official capacity but as state party chairman, but not incorporated, so there's no corporate protection in order to prevent us from holding primaries until they um, get new district lines. So I got court ordered to move the primary to April 8th, and then I got court ordered to move the primary to May 29th. Even if it had been on April 8th, I think Rick Santorum still would have been in the race, probably Newt Gingrich, uh, and you would have had a primary. Uh, May 29th, it was just too late. Now, here's the good news <clears throat> on that. But let me back up and, and say, this is the flaw in the process. It's not really what people think it is. It's not the RNC picking the chairman. It's the, I mean, the nominee It's the process. RNC rules do not allow any state to go before March 1st or your delegates are cut to nine delegates. We have 155. So with all due respect to Dan Patrick, and I've told him this, he's filed a bill to move it to February 1st. Why would you do that? It cuts our delegation from 155 to nine. And you don't move up in the process. The reason being, the RNC rules are written so that no state can go prior to March 4th, except for what they call carve-out states, and there are four carve-out states. Those are New Hampshire, Iowa, South Carolina, and Nevada. 
Now here's the kicker. It says in the rules, if any state moves up, the carve-out states are allowed to go 30 days before whenever those states move. So if you move to February 1st, the carve-out states just go to January 1st. If you go to January 1st, they go to December 1st. So moving up our primary has no effect that way. And meanwhile, you lose virtually your entire delegation. <clears throat> now here's the other thing. Because they increased the penalty from 50% of the delegates penalized, because last time the penalty was 50% and Florida still went. It wasn't enough of a deterrent. So that's why they switched it from 50% to nine. So now even Florida has voted to go after March 1st. So I don't think any state will go before March 1st because you lose all your delegates. So that means if you're on March 1st, you're the fifth state. You all follow me on that? Because you have four carve outs. Guess when the Texas primary is? It's the first Tuesday of every month. Guess when the first Tuesday is in 2016? March 1st. So that means we are already scheduled to be the fifth primary with the second largest delegation. Here's another thing a lot of people don't know. The delegates are not apportioned directly proportional to population. They are based not only on population, but turnout in a whole series of bonuses. For example, no, we like this because we win every bonus. <coughs> For example, if you have a majority of the congressional delegation, you get a bonus. If you have one U.S. senator, you get a bonus. If you have two U.S. senators, you get a bonus. If you have the governorship, you have a bonus, etc. If you control the House, you have a bonus. We earned every single bonus last time, so we like this part of the system. As a result, California which has 50% more population, had 164 delegates. We had 155. The next state was New York at 96. The next state was Georgia at 76. Give you a basis of comparison, South Carolina had 26. Florida had 50. We had 155. So we're going to be this giant prize, fifth up, if the courts don't mess this up again. They can. And this redistricting thing may mess up 2014. I don't want to depress y'all, but we're about to go in probably a whole nother round of court cases. So we may not have a primary in March. I hope we do, but we may not. And if they don't get it resolved, it goes up and down again. This could drag out to 2016. I hope it doesn't. So if it doesn't drag out to 2016, not only will we have this huge prize, but the state party also quietly you didn't hear a lot of publicity about this because we don't put out a bunch of press releases to advertise what we're doing. <clears throat> we got a rule a, a legisl a, a statute passed. So Representative Toth voted for it and both passed unanimously in the House and in the State Senate. <clears throat> it allows the state party the flexibility to pick its delegates however it wants, so long as 75% of them are the formula is, is at least based on the, on the primary, but it doesn't have to be proportional, and that's the key. So that means it's up to the delegates at the next state convention, but you could create a winner-take-all, you could do a modified winner-take-all, you could do winner-take-all by a congressional district, you could not do winner-take-alls, but put minimums of, say, 10%, so the candidates would do better and get proportionally better. Uh, you could give a bonus to the winner. So there's a lot of flexibility now with that 155, to make it really attractive for presidential candidates to come campaign in the state. And if that happens, I think Texas will have a bigger influence and we may get a different type of candidate. But that's my hope. Yes, sir. No. Okay. Chairman, oh, last, Steve, last thank question, you very, very much. I, wanna, I tell you, you haven't mentioned what really cost you, and that's the gender gap. I, all these strong women here, you don't know what women are really, the social issues killed you, especially the female, Anglo female. And what are you going to do about that gender gap and keep, keep the sonograms off of I, I tell you, it alienated so many. Would you speak to the gender gap? Sure. All I'm right. <laughs> Hallelujah. If, if you promise me your blood pressure is under control. I, I, I just do this. And I just don't want, you know, I don't want to be responsible. <laughs> All right. You're absolutely right. The Democrats have a gender gap. We won the male vote 52 to 45, so they need, they need to work on that. Uh, now, re regarding... True. It's true. They got a big gender gap. They're seven points down. 
All right, let's talk about gender politics. <laughs> women outvoted men 53 to 47. If women and men had voted equally, which they've done sometimes in the past, that would have been a difference of 1.6% of the 3.8%. So part of the problem wasn't just that we lost a majority of women, which we did 55-44, but also male voters did not vote in their normal numbers. So that, that was part of the problem. Now, I disagree with your premise that it was social issues by themselves that caused us to lose the women's vote, and I'll tell you why. And that is, about, if you remember, about four or five weeks before the election, uh, Romney drew even with Obama and the female vote by all polls. Yet, our position didn't change in the issue. He didn't, he didn't change any positions in the issues, and yet we, we were winning, the, uh, we drew 50-50 in the women's vote. So the premise that it's just those issues that did it. Now, what happened? Well, you can't solve stupid, and we had a couple of candidates say a couple of stupid things, and then that, that really hurt. So those were, those were uh, uh, taken advantage of by the Democrats. But, but I'd also say this, we've, we've won elections with the same platform that we lost elections on. It's really not the platform that's the problem in my estimation, it's the candidate that's explaining the platform. All right, this is like the Apollo Theater. Have y'all ever been to the Apollo Theater? The Apollo Theater, they actually have a man come on the stage with a big giant hook and pull you off, and I've got one here. But I am actually um, happy to hang around for about a half hour out here in the, in the lobby or whatever and just answer questions anybody has. Thank you. parties you come and speak to but I want you to know that you are welcome here we were thrilled to have you we want you to come back because most of us not Walter but most of us uh, vote, vote Republican and he didn't support Obama either by the way but uh, a couple of things you have done a lot of outreach those things that you mentioned about the the new positions you filled in the Republican Party outstanding the fact that you took care of the debt outstanding. And I already told you, I thought you did a really good job of running the convention. So we're really, really glad to have you. Please come back. I do want to say one thing, because we, we focus on those values on the wall all the time. In the Republican Party, it sounds like you work primarily through candidates in their campaigns. So one of the things that we like to do is when we talk to people, we do it um, based on the principles. And we, we communicate directly about the things that we care about. And after the election, after Obama won, it looked like there were a lot of people who voted for him that had no connection to what he was saying. They didn't hear him, they didn't care what he said. It was just the message through the campaign. So the Republican Party, and we as conservatives, can reach out to people and just talk about the principles that underlie the Texas miracle. And, and just the things that we believe on the wall, the things that, the, the reasons that we raise our children the way we raise them that way. That's the stuff that brings us together, and that's the stuff will transcend bad candidates, or a candidate that just chooses not to focus on those things. It's, it's the eternal 50 state campaign that goes on all the time, and we would like to help with that. So. Well, we're going we're gonna to keep filing those because we need, we need to scale our country the Republican, the Republican Party to those values. We're, we're delighted to help with that. All right, so um, we still have a little bit of space in Vacation Liberty School. So those of you with grandkids and kids who need something to do, June 24th through the 28th, it's from 9 to 12. We, we talk about the reason that we are an exceptional country going back to Revolutionary War history. And it happens here, it's 30 bucks, it's the best thing they'll do. Also, my kids have done it every single time they've, they've, we've had it. This is our third year to do it. We need, let's fill that up, and if you know somebody who wants to get their six to 12 year old, the nine year olds seem to respond best to it. But right in there, it is a fantastic opportunity, and let's, what? and it's fun. That's right. It, it is a, it's, it's a fantastic week, so please sign up. 
Um, again, let's see, so next week, we meet every Tuesday at 6.30 here. So hopefully we will see you again, and we will see you again soon, and thank you all very much for being here tonight.